you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks so much. Thank you all. <laughs> okay, that's plenty. Thank you all very, very much. I know that applause was really for our 40th wedding anniversary today. Isn't that great? <laughs> Good evening, and welcome everyone to another Sold Out Engage event. I'd like to recognize the Bush Center board members who are in attendance, Billy Hickey and Mary Margaret Hickey and their daughter Anne Marie Hickey, and Jean Phillips and her daughter Maggie. Uh, I'm especially excited about tonight's Engage program because it features our daughters, Barbara and Jenna. When I first learned I was gonna be a mother, I pictured two babies in my mind. So when the doctor told George and me that we were having twins, my deepest wish was coming true. On November 25th, 1981, our girls arrived, five weeks early, small and healthy and feisty from the moment they were born. Barbara and Jenna were named for each of our mothers. Barbara arrived first, Jenna second, and from then on, George and I each had a baby to hold. Of course, with every wish comes the famous second phase, phrase, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> George and I had little experience with babies and suddenly we were heading home with two. And it's not an exaggeration to say they cried all the time. It took a few months of trial and error, but at last we adjusted to our twins and they began to adjust to the world. We knew their personalities early on. Barbara was a collector of rocks, leaves, and piles of Easter eggs. Jenna was a homebody and a protector. When we were selling our little townhouse in Midland, Jenna got on her tricycle and rode in tight circles around the prospective buyer's feet, pinning her to our concrete patio. Both girls were eager explorers making their way into every nook and cranny of our house, and then venturing down the sidewalk and around the block. Both loved to use their imaginations, creating a cat family and a language of meowing <laughs> <laughs> that we found adorable and their grandparents found hard to understand. I loved every single stage of their growing up, from the time as preschoolers when they scared us half to death by playing on the rocks above the ocean in Maine, to their impromptu theatrical performances, to the hundreds of times they danced up and down at the hallways in our Dallas ranch house. I even loved their teenage years, although I'm not yearning to repeat them. <laughs> what I've loved most is watching them grow together. As an only child, my greatest wish was for a sister or brother. For their entire lives, Jenna and Barbara have had each other. They've been playmates, confidants, cheerleaders, sounding boards, and dreamers. They've been partners in persuasion, right down to their relentless lobbying to get their ears pierced. Though only Jenna lobbied me to get a perm. <laughs> Any night at any house become a, could become a slumber party, and often did. When she heard ghostly noises in the White House, Jenna ran to get in bed with Barbara. Barbara was the one who got Jenna ready for her first date with her future husband, Henry, and she was the one who was there for the birth of both of Jenna's children. Jenna's the one who pushed Barbara to follow her dreams for better health for all and to start a nonprofit Global Health Corps. Jen is the one who believes her sister can do anything. They can finish each other's sentences and each other's dinners. They're teaching Jenna's daughters, Mila and Poppy, the ways of sisterhood, how anything is possible if you do it together. My daughters have kept me grounded. How could I worry about a presidential election when I was worried that Barbara would wear flip-flops to the Austin, Austin High's homecoming celebration, where I knew she was gonna be crowned homecoming queen. She wore them anyway. <laughs> Together, Barbara and Jenna and I have moved in and out of houses, dorm rooms, and apartments, but never out of each other's lives. Tonight, and through the pages of Sisters First, 
you'll get to know the daughters, sisters, and friends that George and I know. They'll share some family secrets, some family bloopers, and some inside jokes. They'll tell you about being part of a big family and a small one. And they'll share their private memories of heartbreaking events that shaped our nation and what it's like to sit next to Vladimir Putin at dinner. <laughs> As they've grown and discovered the world, I've grown and discovered with them. We've shared travel, movies, books, and even some occasional advice on how to be a mom. Tonight is about sisterhood. The two girls who crammed into a tiny red car, toy car, so they could drive side by side, and for years wore matching outfits, have never outgrown their special closeness. Where once they walked across the hall in a suburban house, they're now only a couple of blocks apart in one of the largest cities in the world. I'm happy that my two gir girls have chosen to be sisters first and always. Now I'll invite George to the stage to introduce Barbara and Jenna. Thank you all. Thank you. So uh, this is really exciting for me and Laura. Uh, it's been a heck of a weekend. Yesterday was her birthday, which I remembered. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but what made it special, of course, was Barbara and Jenna are here. Uh, it's, you know, I guess I always thought that they would become authors. I don't think they ever thought I'd become president. <laughs> At any rate, uh, really looking forward to, uh, I've read the book, and I hope you read it. It's, it's really good. Uh, it's funny, they're funny. It's, uh, it's clever, they're clever. Uh, the English is generally pretty good, <laughs> but it's worth reading. And I can't tell you how proud Laura and I are of our girls. Uh, tonight, Meredith Land, anchor of NBC5, is going to interview uh, our daughters, uh, Jenna Bush Hager and Barbara Pierce Bush. Welcome. Happy anniversary, Popsicky and Mom. I know, it's a big one, right? 40. 40. 40. Today they said it was 34. <laughs> Get the joke. We're 35. <laughs> oh, the Bush twins, those wild Bush twins. Favorite line from the book. Well, you it say, was in the first page. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I love this book because it's a lot about perception. And you address that a lot in the book. The whole world was watching your childhood, right? Mm -hmm. And you kind of clear up the perceptions about your personalities. Mm -hmm. Well, we, um, we chose the subtitle stories from our wild and wonderful life. And when we told the publishers who we loved that we wanted that to be the title, they were like, well, wild, they're gonna think, you know, you're referring to when you were wild. <laughs> and we were like, no, we, we know. We know, <laughs> <laughs> we know that. Um, and it is actually from a Mary Oliver poem that um, we love, our mom and our grandmother, um, Jenna Welch loves, and the end says, doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me what it is you plan to do with your one wild and precious life. And really, life is wild. Um, it's not just margarita wild. Um, <laughs> it's wild that we're sitting, you know, that our dad was president. That's wild. Unbelievable. <laughs> um, that we're sitting here with all of y'all in his library and that the work um, that they have done has helped motivate Barbara to do such incredible work. That's wild. Um, that I am a colleague of Meredith Land's, that's pretty wild. Pretty wild. I would never have thought that um, 10 years ago. And so I think that's why um, we wanted to take the word wild back. Mm -hmm. And it felt really, we didn't do, we didn't write a book to do that, but it does feel empowering to tell your own story. I bet. So did you get together to write it together? How was this written? Well, we wrote in silos because we both have full-time jobs, so we couldn't actually physically write it together. And um, it took a while for me to agree to do it. I have 
intentionally been more private than my sister and that has been a choice and a decision. So we knew that if we were gonna write it, once we decided to, that we did need to be very authentic and um, vulnerable and share many stories. So we would go on long walks with each other and brainstorm about what we actually wanted to write and um, figure out who was gonna write what chapter and then we would go off and write. And what was sort of eerie and not surprising though is that we would almost write the exact same paragraphs. Wow. Um, because we're twins, because our viewpoint's always been the same, there hasn't been one of us that was older and therefore didn't, had different memories. And right. so we had to actually edit enormous amounts of the book because we would have written almost word for word the same paragraphs. There was one paragraph that we were fought over because it was about being in Maine with our grandparents and getting into bed with them. And it is, you know, a lot of your memories are based off of things like that um, story that my mom told in her foreword of chasing around. I mean, I remember being reckless and that, that tricycle, but I don't remember exactly um, pinning that person in, although it doesn't... <laughs> Doesn't it doesn't surprise doesn't me. doesn't surprise me. Um, I am protective <laughs> of my family and, um, and of my, my house <laughs> that was being taken away. Um, but, you know, <laughs> so many of our memories are things that have been passed around by generations before, by stories that our parents have told us. And really, who we are is shaped by our parents, by who they make us feel like we can be. Um, and that was interesting, I think, because obviously we also have, um, you know, a very similar relationship with our parents, um, and we're the same age at the same time from them. And I think, particularly, our mom tried to both give us both what we were interested in and help us find what we were interested in and give us this one-on-one -on -one time yeah. that's important when you're a twin to figuring out your... <laughs> You look so pretty there, Mom. <laughs> uh, even though I know you were tired. <laughs> to fi I can't even imagine. But to figuring out your own identity. Right. Talk a little bit about who you think the public thinks you are versus who you really are. Well, it's hard for us to answer that just because we don't know what other people Most think people us don't like, tell us. Uh, yeah, some people do ha tell us. So, and usually what <laughs> some people, what we hear most <laughs> often is people come up to us and they'll say, you're so normal. And Would we're you? like, but that's maybe that, I think that's a compliment, <laughs> but what we want to hear is, you're so exceptional and wildly amazing. Or you're so, you look so fabulous, <laughs> you know? You, but really, we just hear you're normal, which I think is a compliment and a tribute. And I think in this book, a lot of what was fun about writing was this duality between the exceptional, which is having a grandfather that was vice president when we were born, but obviously we didn't really know that. Right. What we knew was our grandparents in Midland, Texas, Jenna and Harold Welch, who we saw every single day. That was much more of our reality. Um, and they, I think, had a, even though we adore our other grandparents, oh gosh. <laughs> we're pulling out all the Mom, pictures. How could you have let me wear that? <laughs> Jenna loved that outfit. Barbara Juice. Is that a tie? Yes. yes. <laughs> and, and it's wow. a silk and mustard shirt. And it's mustard. Shirt. It's a silk and mustard And I still shirt. like mustard. A friend of mine is wearing mustard in the front row. And I still want, I want to. You'll notice a theme that Jenna has mustard on in many of the photos. <laughs> My mom told me I looked good in mustard. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you clearly owned it. You clearly. I don't know what that was, but it, <laughs> it was. It was. It cheap. took some confidence. Yeah. Very cheap. Um, I don't even know what you asked us. Well, I wanted you. <laughs> I don't either. Um, <laughs> that I, picture really distracted. I, that derailed us a bit. Um, describe Barbara. Well, Barbara, and well, I think one of the things that people think about Barbara is that she's quiet, which is not true. I mean, any of her friends that are here would say she's. Um, hilarious. She's an incredible public speaker. She's given a TED talk, which is complicated, and she did it so beautifully. Um, she has an incredible heart. I was just on a flight with her, flying back from, and it makes me want to cry, from um, Auburn, Alabama. We talked at the school, and in Atlanta, she saw Brian Stevenson, who's the head of the Equal Justice Initiative, on the plane. And of course, I know who Brian Stevenson is, but I want to be able to see him. And Barbara follows his work, and she goes, there's Brian Stevenson. And everybody was getting on the plane still, which is like a very high stress time. You know, I'm like, Are you, you're going to get up and battle that, that <laughs> traffic? She's like, I'm like, why don't you just wait a minute? She's like, no, one minute. She gets up, and she walks up to him, 
and she's like, I just wanna let you know your work is difficult, but in your hardest days, it's worth it. And I heard her say all this and he looked up and smiled and then she sat back down. And I think that really epitomizes Barbara. She has a giant heart and she chooses, to, she chooses. <laughs> That's the English my dad referred to. Um, <laughs> but really, we learned it from him, so. It's, yeah. <laughs> He passed it down to us. He passed up the slips. Um, she chooses to use it to help the world, which is such a tiring and selfless thing to do. Thanks, Sissy. Really sweet. Describe Jenna. Well, I think no one will be surprised by this, but Jenna is the most fun human I know. <laughs> um, she has made my life so fun, you'll read about it. She's always been an entertainer, so even though we were all surprised that she joined NBC, I wasn't actually surprised because she loves entertaining people yeah. and telling stories. She really loves telling stories. She loved it all of her life. And um, she loves making people laugh. And there's many a chapter, but often um, <laughs> I was not surprised that she pursued this because what she really wanted as a child was to be a Broadway star. She wanted to be a performer. Particularly, she wanted to be in Les Miserables. The thing is, if you go back to that yellow mustard shirt, I never had a chance. I was, I was like a well-fed Texan, you know, blonde Texan, tanned, and it's like nothing about that screamed French Revolution. <laughs> but I was like, I'm perfect for you, Cosette. They were she like, really wanted it. to be Cosette. She had a little olden times broom that she would sweep around while she sang. And anyway, this is a long way of getting at it. I would just describe Jenna as joyful and so fun, and, and that's also a choice. You can choose to be happy and joyful. It's the same amount of energy as it is to be negative or not. And um, that has made my life so hilarious and fun. Uh, okay, first memory of the White House, because your grandfather was there first. What is your very first memory? Well, our first moment, we walked in, we were cold, because um, I don't think our mom put on a, a strong enough layer for DCs. <laughs> for the inauguration. I think if we had one extra layer of long johns, of long johns we would have been warm enough. But we were cold, and so my mom took us back to the White House <laughs> early. I mean, another mustard. I know. Um, <laughs> it's a theme. There will be more mustard in this slideshow. <laughs> anyway, so we... Um, <laughs> And we were just at Target in Alabama, and I wanted to buy Mila and Poppy some mustard skirts, and she was like, you need to get away from mustard. They were velvet mustard. I thought they were so cute. But anyway, okay, so... Um, Back to the White House. Okay. Um, we... <laughs> Walked in, we were too cold, so I think our mom sent us back. You weren't with us, were you? No. Well, I mean, who walked us home? We were We seven. were in first grade. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, you've got it. Uh, so we walked by ourselves into the White House, and um, the florist, the head florist there, her name was Nancy, said, why don't you come in and we'll make a bouquet of flowers? And of course, like- To put on our grandparents' bedside. There's nothing more magical for two girls and, that are seven. And so we walked in and we made the, and flower arrangements. And then Nancy was the one that did um, the flowers at my wedding to Henry. And um, she's passed away since. But I think that was the common theme. I mean, even when I've been able to return since, it's the people that worked there that make it feel like mm -hmm. a home. And your parents and your grandparents were really careful to keep you, you said, normal at the beginning of this. But were you just like ordering food and sandwiches? I know you did the first time you were there. No. They, they didn't no, have that. No, that's not allowed. That is absolutely not allowed, especially if your grandmother is Barbara Bush. <laughs> <laughs> so no, certainly not. Um, I mean, our parents did really do their best to keep us normal. And we, again, as Jenna said, I mean, we lived in Dallas when our grandfather was elected. We rode president. our bike to Preston Hollow Elementary. You know, we lived in a house that couldn't have been more different than the White House. It yes. was like a three bedroom 1950s ranch house, you know? Or maybe, was it four bedrooms? Three. Three. I mean, so it was like getting into the White House was like this. A dream. But they did <laughs> such a good job at keeping us normal, and I write about this in the book, that I actually believed that everybody's grandfather was president. I didn't know that it was yeah. our grandfather that was president. I thought that you became president when you were a grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> and I found my journal where I asked Catherine Oliver, I don't think she's here, she was in Dallas, when her grandfather's inauguration was gonna be. And I was so excited at the inauguration because there is, there's a huge parade, there's balloons, there's confetti. I mean, it's everything you've dreamed of when you're seven. So I think that I'm coming back to Texas and I have 
many inaugurations that I get to attend because <laughs> everyone's grandfather is about to have an inauguration. She's like, America loves grandfathers. We just celebrate them. We just them. celebrate them. So it was a real wake-up call. <laughs> I'm sure. And we weren't allowed to order food. No, our grandmother caught us going into the bowling alley, ordering peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. We were waiting for them to come, and then all of a sudden, it was not the sandwiches, but our grandmother burst in and said, under no circumstance do you order anything. This is not a hotel. This is a temporary home. And we were like, yes, ma'am. <laughs> So we, that wasn't, I mean, you do, you treat it like a house. Right. And speaking of your grandmother, you share a name with your grandmother. Yeah. And there are some pretty hilarious stories around that. Yes. <laughs> but well, by the way, mom I claims know. that she named her Barbara Bush not knowing that Ganny was going to be famous. She was the v wife of the vice president at the time that I was born. <laughs> so, so dad? Uncle, yeah, dad, what's your take? Did you know she was going to be famous? <laughs> Well, you can imagine, I, again, I thought everyone's grandfather was president, so it took me a while to realize that people were surprised by my name being the same name as the first lady. So I was hung up a lot on when I would order pizza. There was sort of Because <laughs> imagine like when she was first lady and Barbara had a little like seven-year-old voice and she's like, may I have pizza for Barbara Bush? Like hang up. They thought she was pranking. <laughs> So, I mean, and that really took me a long time to figure out. I thought that I had done something wrong, but I couldn't figure out what I had done wrong for a large part of my life. But it's gotten continuously funny. Um, email, maybe. Yeah, I'll go to the email. This is in the book. And my grandmother had a great attitude about this being in the book. My cousin Wendy once wrote me an email. The subject line was, bikini waxing or electrolysis, question <laughs> mark. And she <laughs> writes me an entire email wondering should she get a bikini wax, electrolysis, laser hair removal, what should it be? And the intro line is, yo, what up? <laughs> so she writes this, she presses send. It had not put in my email address, it had auto-filled the other Barbara Bush's email address. <laughs> she had sent it to my grandmother. <laughs> but, in a classic move, my grandmother didn't bat an eyelash. She replies, she says she doesn't wax, she stays far, far away from harsh products like Nair, and she can't wait to see Wendy this summer. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> oh my goodness. All right, I wanna talk about when your parents sat you down and said, we're going, we're running for president. Mm. This is happening. What was that oh. first conversation like? We've actually been, we want, we to, want apologize. to apologize. <laughs> we like we talk in unison now. We speak in unison. We only talk in unison. <laughs> yes, we speak. ready. We we, we apologize. apologize for saying we've been feeling terrible about when we cried. When, when we cried. When we cried. We said you were going to lose. <laughs> we actually told we're going to lose. We told him he was going to lose twice. First to Ann Richards. First with Ann Richards, we said he was going to lose because she was. We heard she was. Popular. We were like, Dad, she's very, very popular. We were like, we people at it. school are telling us that she's very well liked. You will probably lose. Um, and then we were twelve when he sat us down in the governor's mansion. I mean, we had a very even high school was very normal for us. We didn't have security. We lived in the governor's mansion, really? but it was really fun. We could um, walk to restaurants with our parents. We went to Austin High School. We do have a sort of dramatic, um, you want to talk about the thing and I'll read. Well, here's a dramatic diary entry from 5 There's a handful in here. 5296. <laughs> Today has been a hard day for me. This morning there was a picture of Barbara and me in the newspaper and an article on us going to AHS. How dumb is that? <laughs> there are a thousand freshmen going to AHS. So what makes me special? Our last name? How unfair is that? <laughs> really sucks is I'll be known for Jenna Bush the thing instead of Jenna Bush the person. I'll be known as the governor's daughter, not as who I am. Anyway. No, I, I would keep just read okay. the last sentence. There, which one? The, okay. okay. There are a lot of people at AHS and I know I won't be friends with them by the time I graduate. So to some of those unknown faces, I'll still be just the governor's daughter. <laughs> I know it's not my parents' fault, but I'm taking it out on them. <laughs> I think it's been a hard week. It, I've had a horrible week. My best friend Kate and I've had some trouble. <laughs> but other than that picture, um, we had a really normal high school life. <laughs> 
that was just me getting it out in, in my journal. Um, that was some teenage <laughs> angst. Um, but basically, um, so when he said he was going to run for president, it did come as a shock. We cried. We told him he was going to ruin our life. Um, <laughs> But then I think we really quickly realized the privilege of living history, and we apologize. Yeah, and we're very sorry for saying you're going to lose. Reflection, and we feel terrible. So I guess you were shocked when he won. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there was a recount. It was not a. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't. A it wasn't. Let's just say it wasn't a clean sweep. <laughs> Oh I mean, God. once he was in, we wanted him to win, but it wasn't, it was a complicated time in our country. <laughs> <laughs> but Chad, all I know is I'll never name a kid Chad. Never name a kid Chad. <laughs> Chad. <laughs> oh my gosh, well. That was a good one, Susan. That was good. That was good. Moving into the White House, was it, were you excited? Were you worried about the scrutiny that you'd be under? Did you know what was coming? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, we didn't know that. Um, but we also never actually lived in the White House. You were in college. I actually oh, lived right. with Gloria Moncrief. Sorry, Gloria, to you too. <laughs> Shout out. <laughs> it was a tough time. <laughs> I apologize. But you were, you know, you were in college. So you yes, had we lived in dorms. Right. So you had to, your Secret Service trail you everywhere, right? And what was that like being in college with Secret Service? Well, I mean, we, I write about this in the book. We were prickly, definitely, when we were At the getting beginning. Secret Service. We did not want them. We really wanted to be independent. I purposely chose, away, chose to go away to school where I didn't know anyone because I love challenges like that. And, um, and so it was a lot happening at once, definitely, because I chose to go to a very liberal campus when my dad was running for president mm -hmm. and got Secret Service pretty quickly thereafter and didn't know anyone. Um, and that I was probably a lot. That's potentially a lot. was the only person that voted. I mean, I don't know if anyone <laughs> voted for him. I did it, Yale. I don't know about anyone else's <laughs> decisions. But the, so we were prickly at the beginning about having Secret Service because we wanted independence. But I write about this in the book. Um, it changed quick. First of all, if you had seen us then, you wouldn't have noticed that we had Secret Service. They were great and they held way back. And our details were pretty young and they dressed like college kids minus a fanny pack. And uh, <laughs> they tried really hard to give us space. I ended up becoming, it all really changed after 9-11. I was with, uh, my Secret Service men came to get me um, when the second Twin Tower fell. Because obviously before that, we'd all thought it was an accident. So they came to my dorm. They got me, I mean, I didn't even bring anything with me because we just didn't know what to do. And we got out of our dorm right away. And we went first to this random sterile office space in New Haven, and then we went to a motel off the highway because we needed to go somewhere where no one would think that we were. But all of my detail was out of New York. And the Secret Service office in New York City at the time was in World Trade Center Tower 7. So it wasn't hit, but it collapsed. And I was with all of them as they were all calling to make sure their families were OK and checking on their own colleagues who had been at in that area, in that building. And we were all basically crying and grieving together. And so from then on, and I write this, they really became my brothers. And they were just so amazing. Um, they, we couldn't get away from each other basically that day. And they, some of them had their families come from New York to New Haven because they didn't want their kids or their wives to be alone in, in New York. And so Steve, my head secret service man, his wife and daughter came to New Haven, and, his, and it was so sweet, and it's really just kind of a wonderful image in my mind. She's five, she was five at the time, and she was so excited to have a slumber party with her parents in a hotel room. And so she was jumping wildly on the bed, because she obviously did not know what wow. had just happened a few hours before, and it was just such a stark contrast. But they went and got my roommates, because I was by myself, and they brought them to spend the night with me in the motel, which was such a very generous gesture. How about you on 9-11? What was your experience? Well, my experience, I, I was actually at a different hotel. I was at a, um, 
it was this very similar, but you know, my, I was by myself really all day long because I had a room by myself. And I talked to my, my sister, I talked to my mom, and then later in the day after my dad um, had landed, had landed, he called, he got in touch with me. But I was, you know, they, Barbara was in an office building. I was taken to a hotel early in the morning mm -hmm. um, and was really just in a room by myself for the entire day. But so it was real, you know, Barbara, I think, had a more, uh, a different, and we all had very right. yeah, different. Were you worried about your dad? Yeah, I mean, of course, but really, no, because we know who our dad is and how, um, I mean, no more than anybody else was worried about their family members and all of our, I remember we were in college, so I remember, of course, like this sort of the hysteria of young people never seeing anything like this before. Everybody was worried about their families. Right. You didn't have any fun at University of Texas, mm. did you? No. <laughs> I sure, Articles were not written. I sure didn't. <laughs> about your time at It was at too University. bad I couldn't enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> That's one regret that I write about in the book is that I really could have had a more college-like experience. <laughs> um, no, we had fun. And actually, when you ask, were we prepared, we were not um, prepared at all for, I mean, we thought of ourselves as so normal that, and I could reach. That we read? walked into a Mexican restaurant and ordered margaritas <laughs> together. As we know, right? That was stupid. <laughs> what was the headline? Um, Oops, they did it again. Well, that was one. Yeah, I actually liked <laughs> that. Would um, be when we were on the cover of People magazine for right. it. I liked gin and tonic, although it's it's <laughs> inaccurate because um, I don't like tonic. I prefer so. They got it wrong. No, to think tonic is gross. It should have been gin and soda. Gin and soda is better. Um, there's a, here's a little part that somebody had a writer had me read. So like at most colleges, one of the big things to do at the University of Texas at Austin, where I was a first year student, was for the older girls who had already turned 21 to give the younger ones their IDs. Of course, the reason why you might want an ID before you were 21 was to drink. Most of my friends had IDs from older girls and I didn't think anything about it. And I'll remember this girl came up and she's like, everybody says we look exactly alike, this is for you. And like neither one of us thought, you know what? This could be a bad idea. <laughs> like I remember just like, and I, a lot of my freshmen, a lot of my college friends are here like running up and being like, somebody gave me this, isn't this great? She looks just like me. Um, <laughs> So I never stopped to consider, oh, wait a minute, now that my dad is president, people are going to recognize me. <laughs> I just wanted to be like my friends, and I was, although when I went wild, I ended up in a double-page spread in the National Enquirer with a huge caption reading, Pal and Christy, you're in this one too. Pals say she's a hard-drinking party animal. <laughs> The headline, get ready America, here comes George W's wild daughter. <laughs> now as a 30 something mom of two daughters, a mom whose clothes are usually sticky from somebody's leftover juice box, I almost can't believe that there were ever photos of me in mid fall next to one of my girlfriends, both of us holding cigarettes. <laughs> About the only thing I'm great. Anyway, the point is, <laughs> we weren't prepared. And um, when I got in trouble, I called my dad the first time, and I was like, "Dad, I'm so sorry." And and I think one of the things about becoming president is that, you know, you don't know what it's going to be like. He he could never have predicted September 11th. You don't know how your what's going to happen. And so you can, you're just going to. All he would say is, "It's going to be fine. Y'all can go. You you can be normal because that's all we wanted." So of course you're going to say to your children, "It's going to be okay." Um, you don't know how it's going to be. And um, and so when I said I called him and I said I'm so sorry when I got in trouble the first time, and he was like. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the second time it was a little different conversation, but uh, <laughs> the first time, and he was like, no, I'm sorry. You know, I promised you normalcy, and this isn't going to be normal. I mean, it wasn't. I mean, it, you know, uh, those, and, not, and by the way, the National Enquirer, it's like, whatever. But, but right. the point is, is that, um, <laughs> is that, is that you, you know, I, we are unbelievably protective of children, of true children, of presidential children, of presidents, because it's not like we said to our dad, okay, we have a great idea. You're going to run for president. We're going to be your first children. We'll be the first children, and we'll see how this all goes. There's no guidebook, and I do really thank my parents for allowing us to make mistakes. Um, because I think it's really important for people to make mistakes so that they can learn and grow. And I don't know how I could be a parent myself um, if I was raised to some expectation of perfection, which yeah. people are not perfect. No. 
And so I had a great time. You thank had you. a great time. <laughs> <laughs> we had fun watching. Uh, thank you. <laughs> the press, which ironically, but no, you weren't a member of the I press. I wasn't then. a member of the you're press. You're like then. my age. <laughs> I mean, you were doing the same thing in South Carolina. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> um, I still remember my fake IDs name. See, but anyway, um, ironically, you are a member of the press now. I know. I mean, who knew, right? You used to run from the press. I know. Didn't you oh, run from Savannah picture. Guthrie? Yeah, and Savannah is, she's one of my very best friends. Um, Henry said today that she was like, bring the girls over this afternoon if you need some, some help. But then Poppy got the norovirus, and so. <laughs> oh, Lord. I was like, please don't take her over to <laughs> Savannah's. Um, I think that's a really interesting lesson in life, that one, you know, you keep your option open, and who knows what can happen. Mm -hmm. um, I really like my job. I think it's really fun and I work with such incredible women in particular. I mean, I, everybody's great, but the women are the type of people that would say, bring your babies over if you need help. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why we wrote this book is that we've always had that in each other, but women should have that in every aspect of their lives, with their friends, with their mothers, with their work colleagues. We should feel like we're getting lifted up. Um, and I want that for my girls. I'd be so thrilled if they had the type of colleagues that I have. Yeah. Barbara, what kind of father is your dad? He's a wonderful father. Um, he's the best father in the world. And I mean that very honestly. Um, he has, I'm gonna find something to read if I can find it. You want me to fill in for you for a second? Yes, what, um, I'm teleporting something to you. Okay. Yeah. Um, our, do you want me to talk about me or you? Me. <laughs> me or you? It. Okay, she found it. I found it. Um, our dad has been an incredible father. I've, I think one thing that's been so lucky for us and probably why we were even comfortable writing a book and knowing that we were putting ourselves out there is we've always known that we were very, very loved. And um, always, our parents always allowed us to believe that we were enough. And um, my dad is just stable. And I think that's what something you were, when Jenna said she wasn't, we weren't worried about our dad having to handle 9-11 because we've always known that he would take on whatever responsibility and he really had neither to. of our parents have ever given us the burden to have to worry about them yeah um, because they're strong and they've you know they've gave, gave us that freedom to know that they were going to be okay which is a g big gift yes so something that i write about in um, here is about um, going through a heartbreak when i was not that many years ago but it's about my dad um, Let's see, when I had my first devastating heartbreak in my early 30s, I'd ride the subway wondering if anyone could see that inside my chest, my heart was torn in two. And when my heart hurt so badly, I couldn't help but wonder how many other people riding the subway felt the same. How many others were wandering the city with broken hearts. My dad was the first person I called after that breakup. I don't know why. I never shared much about my relationships with him. I'm private, like my mother, but through it all, struggling to hold the belief that someone could be wonderful, while also understanding you shouldn't build the rest of your life with them, I relied on my dad. And daily, he would call or text, just to check in, just to share the burden with me. He didn't make promises of things getting better or the relationship ultimately working out, but he just shared that while my heart hurt now, it would not always feel that way. Every morning, I would wake to a text from him just saying hi, his usual, love you baby, and in a small way, affirming that heartbreak hurts and that is okay. I picked up the pieces, but he never stopped texting every morning. Every night I read a meditation, a short modern day interpretation of a Christian Bible verse meant as a form of silent prayer before I doze off. And every morning he rereads the same meditation from the same book, <clears throat> texting me the verse, which he has illustrated by emojis. <laughs> <laughs> I text back my own emoji picture. It is short and it is daily, 5.30 a.m. Texas time, 6.30 a.m. New York time, waiting there for me when I open my eyes. It is so simple and yet it is everything. That's really sweet. Could I get one of those texts one day? <laughs> <laughs> just, just once. <laughs> <laughs> would you like to add something just, about your dad? Well, one, just one, just one text. One day would be good. Um, no, <laughs> um, I, 
I, I feel the same way and I feel like, it's funny that it's been through text, I write about a text. There's been certain days where he knows there's been something going on with work or with life that's made me feel heavy. And he, I've gotten texts from him that I've read to colleagues that have made me weep at work, um, where he says about you know what's important, where he says you know your girls are important, your family who loves you is important. I um, once made a mistake, is it? And um, I felt really horrible about it. And I got a text from my dad that said, here are some thoughts, it's no big deal. Your family loves you, which is a lot more important than one slip. I made a lot of slips, and overall they did not matter. The world is full of people who wanna take someone down, but there are many more people who think you are great. So let it go, be your charming natural self. All will be well, love your dad. And in moments like that, there's more that I, I didn't put every text in the book, that would be not fair, but there, um, <laughs> there have been a lot of moments like that where I've re re gotten something that has made me all of a sudden feel like I was home or grounded. Um, and I think we're really lucky for that. I want to talk about your mom too, because there's so many neat moments in the book about your mom and watching the stars at night. And, and she kept your childhood so normal, as mm -hmm. we've been saying. What do you... <coughs> What would you want to say about your mom and your childhood mm -hmm. that maybe not everybody knows? Oh my gosh, well, our mom has been an amazing mother because she had two wild little beasts with <laughs> us at the same time. And, um, and I think we reflect, now that I have two little kids, I've reflected on what motherhood really takes and it's not easy because you're, you know, you want desperately for your children to be happy. Um, and she, you know, we always knew she wanted that for us, but also she was an only child who wanted other siblings, I think, and, and had great friends who were like mm -hmm. sisters or are like sisters to her, um, but that's what we had. And I think even now sometimes I'll be giving the girls a bath and I'll, they'll like make some sort of gross noise and I'll be like, please don't do that and then they'll both do it and laugh and like gang up on me or, or they, Mila started calling me Mr. Man. Um, <laughs> And Poppy thinks it's hilarious, and Henry thinks it's hilarious. Um, and so, like, my, I know it is, my mom thinks it's hilarious. <laughs> um, and the thing is, it, I feel like um, that, I, but I'm like, oh, that's so Barbara and me, and I can relate with that. Whereas the opposite of twins, um, oh gosh, another questionable choice, but um, <laughs> the Very opposite patriotic. of twins is an only child because we had each other and we were so close in age, and we still, even when we're spending the night with our parents, my mom's like, don't you want to stay in your bedroom, Barbara? And she's like, no, I want to stay in Jenna's. And I think, um, so only now that we're adults do we realize that I'm sure she loved being our mom, but I'm sure that we could have been a pain to be a mother of too. <laughs> <laughs> so we're sorry. <laughs> what else? Well, mom, um, I mean, we really spent a lot of time with our mother and um, you kind of mentioned what would be surprising. I think there are so many things that are surprising and a big part of what was fun to explore in the book is how so many people in our family that we love have been stereotyped in certain ways. And um, like our dad can read. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think people, I don't know exactly how mom's been stereotyped because of course we only hear certain things and largely what we hear is people saying that they our mom is her. beautiful and graceful and they love her. Yeah. Um, but there, in the beginning of the book, I write about also how I was fearful that my mom was gonna leave my dad for Van Morrison, even though she'd never <laughs> met Van Morrison, but she loved his music so much and talked about how much she loved it so much that I, again, there was a disconnect in me really understanding what was going on. She didn't, in fact, leave our dad for Van Morrison. <laughs> but you know what? It's not too, I mean, not no, that I'm so Why would you encourage that? <laughs> well, I just know that Van Morrison is still alive, although I think dad's aged better than Van Morrison. Yeah, I don't think, don't, don't. No, I'm not encouraging it. 40 years is, let's yeah, keep Yeah, let's going. keep it moving. Keep it going. <laughs> um, but our moms always loved great music, and one of my favorite memories from high school is I heard at school 
that the Whalers were gonna be playing a secret show in Austin. And so I went home and told my mom, and we got all dressed up to go to this secret Whalers concert. But of course, it was a school night, so my mom and I show up at the club, and there is not a <laughs> single other person there, because we show up like four hours too early. And then we didn't even wait to hear the Whalers because it was a school night and we had to go. Um, but my mom is just very different than I think people. And she's had, you know, I think because she's so gracious and graceful um, and kind and gentle, which is something we're working on. Uh, I'm, I'm working on. Um, <laughs> people forget that she uses her voice. Um, yeah. And, and are used and, and still uses, but when she was first lady, she did so much. And neither one of my parents needed like the appreciation or the, or the accolades or needed people to know what they did. That's not the reason why they did it. They did it because it was right. And um, we've watched that since she was, since we were little girls. Um, and I think, you know, she taught us how to use our voices. Yeah, especially in ways that are authentic to us because she's done it so authentically. Exactly. And you've said, Jenna, to me before, you know, people meet us and they think, well, your dad thinks this and your mom, so you must think this, but you weren't really raised to think exactly how they, to no. be individuals yeah. was the point. Mm -hmm. Our parents right? definitely wanted us to be individuals and maybe, I don't know, I don't think it was con a conscious decision. Like, they weren't like discussing it or I don't think they even read any books where they were like, how can we raise our children to have their own opinions, but I know it was something that they did. Um, they wanted us to think for ourselves and be curious and independent and use our voices in ways that we thought were right to help people and to make a difference. But it, but it was subtle. Um, I think it's a really brave way to parent because it's so much easier to just have kids that believe the exact same thing as you. Um, believe me, I'm, I may choose the other way of parenting. Um, <laughs> just kidding. But I think, you know, um, I, and maybe it's just because we come up from a political family, because obviously everybody has parents, and not everybody believes everything their parents. Yeah, but it does come as a surprise to people. I mean, I write about this in the book. I, um, in 2011, made a video for marriage equality in New York City, and after I did that, people would come up to me really regularly and say, you know, thank you for doing that. That's so brave of you to betray your family like that. And I was so taken aback that that is what the perception was because that's never what it felt like. And I, in fact, had talked to my parents both and especially to my dad before doing it to figure out if I should do it. And um, what he was helping me think through was not my opinion because I already knew what my opinion was and he respected it, mm -hmm. but was how best to use my voice. And would doing this, which ended up, you know, I thought like 12 people were gonna see it on YouTube and it ended up on the front page of the New York Times and then was in every single taxi cab throughout New York City on the taxi TV, <laughs> which I never got the heads up on. So it just was a different thing. So he was helping me figure out how to use my voice and if it would be effective and what I was comfortable with. And we'd had all those conversations well, I had, well before I had done the video. And so the reaction that it was a betrayal was always so surprising to me because in many ways, it was actually acting on what we had been raised to do in terms of if our voice can make an impact on something that we care about, be thoughtful about it and figure out how you can make an impact. But also it's your responsibility as a human to try to be a doer and, and do things that affect change that are positive. Was there anything in the book that really surprised your parents? A story they didn't know, a feeling you had that they didn't know about? Well, I <laughs> gave my dad the chapter that I read from to read, and it was the first time anyone had read it, and I was so excited because I wanted dad to be the first to read it. And I was staying here, so he, I, you know, I was like, did you read it? And he was like, yeah, it's revealing. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, like, good revealing or bad revealing? Should I edit it? Is it enough? And he was like, no, it's revealing. And he just kind of stuck, and then I had to go to mom and be like, mom, dad read the chapter. I'd love some feedback now because I don't want to release the chapter without it being good. And all he's saying is that it's revealing. So then mom had to kind of be our translator between us. <laughs> they, our parents, I, I mean, they let us write whatever were our true emotions. And I'm sure things surprised them. They they're more, were more interested in the editing process. My dad was like, this sentence is too, too long. Dad uh, they both, edited two versions both of, of the them, book with us. Both of them And then edited. mom submitted edits the last day edits were allowed. That's where I get, is that where I get it from? The procrastination? Mm -hmm. 
Was there something that you didn't include because they said, just no. don't do this? No. No. Really? Our, pa our parents there. have never really said, don't do this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they haven't. They've allowed us to be ourselves, and these, these are our voices and our stories. I was nervous about my grandmother's chapter because I write about a tennis match that I had, um, <laughs> and I wish I could tell you that the tennis match happened. 10, 15, 15 years 20. ago. Unfortunately, it happened two years ago um, <laughs> after the birth of two children. And I, um, Explain in, it. in the match, I was, I was right. not playing very well. It was a family tennis tournament. And I was playing with the tennis pro because he asked to be my partner. The one non-family member. He had asked to be my partner. No. Um, anyway. No. The okay. tennis match, <laughs> it was almost rigged. Okay, but anyway, <laughs> so um, I was not playing well, so I would do certain tricks to make, ma and mainly my dad was egging me on. He would say things like, that's my girl. Yes, you but did. But what were your tricks? I did the shim a shimmy, I did the worm. <laughs> she held a plank, I held and then plank. I think the final straw was when she lifted her tennis skirt to our entire family. After but I had, had on child. tennis pants underneath. They were large, I can promise you. I just had a child. Um, but, and dad was like sitting on the line, the sideline screaming things like, that's my girl. <laughs> so we were having fun. Anyway, I was nervous because I got a letter. Then, you know, fall came. I'd forgotten all, everything about the summer. I get a letter from my grandmother. I open it. Henry hears me and he's like, what has happened? She's I'm like, crying. Ganny is very disappointed. <laughs> He's like, what? Like, we haven't even seen Ganny in two months. I'm like, she says I had bad sportsmanship. <laughs> there was a letter, Dear Jenna and George. <laughs> the thing that made me feel bad was she said I, had I would have disappointed my grandfather, which broke my heart into a thousand pieces because we adore him so much. But the, anyway, the postscript said, don't show this letter to anyone. So she published. So I published it. <laughs> <laughs> so I was so nervous about her reaction to it that I was like, she was, when we were in Maine, she said, do you have a galley? And we had a galley, but I was like, no, we don't have a galley. I was Not like, ready. oh gosh, Barbara. I guess she can't read this. And then I sent her the book, um, or actually I didn't. The publisher just sent it to her, and I was like, oh, great, thank you. Um, and she got it, and I was like, oh, no. And she wrote me that she loved it, and so that was a relief. And she also wrote that she was, she was worried we weren't going to include the waxing story that I referred to earlier, and she thought that we should because humor is important, and then she read the waxing story and emailed us and said, oh, great, you included it. <laughs> You got that one in. She's coming tomorrow to Houston, she and our grandpa, so we'll see how she really feels. But so far, so good. Uh, you've lived in Texas, D.C., New York. What's home? Well, I think Texas. Texas is home. When people ask us where we're from, we say... Texas. And I haven't lived in Texas for 18 years. And I haven't lived here for... I can't remember how long. Um, <laughs> we usually... Um, I think home is also where our family is. Our... Yeah book is very much centered around family, where we spend time, which is in Crawford and Dallas. And Maine. And Maine. Um, and then in New York for us. And we usually end with this, and since I see there's a minute left, I'll keep it on time. because You're you know, good. You know You're somebody good. likes to leave on time. The I world do. has often <laughs> compared Barbara and me, but our parents never did. I realize now how easy it would be to quip, Jenna, your sister never acts that way. Your sister doesn't impulsively kick a soccer ball into our front window. Or why don't you make A's like your sister? And because of that, the bond we shared from before birth was solidified. I was never jealous of Barbara, although I should have been envious of her near perfect SAT score. And she was ne never jealous of me. Her successes were my successes. Her heartbreaks were also mine. Recently, Melinda Gates, Barbara's ultimate girl crush, tweeted an article about Barbara. I was riding the subway and saw the tweet during a brief respite with Wi-Fi, and I wanted to yell out to all the passengers, see, my sister is a global health star. Even Melinda Gates knows she's saving the world. When people stop me and inquire about my more elusive sister, they typically ask, is she married? I understand their curiosity, but internally I beg them to ask about what she's doing. I want to tell them about the work she does, about the nonprofit she started all by herself, and about all that she's accomplished. And recently I did just that. A woman at an event asked in a worried, worried tone, now why isn't your sister married? 
I mean, I've heard it too many times. I took a deep breath, although I'm starting to take deeper breaths. And holding them. And holding them. And responded, she is married to her work, Global Health Corps. You can Google it. Oh, and she has a nice boyfriend too. Was it too extreme? Maybe. But that is what sisters do. They want the best for each other. They always protect each other. Not too long ago, I picked up Mila from her preschool. And she smiled her wide smile and said, Mama, a word I will never tire of hearing. I know I need to get home to my kids when I start to cry <laughs> at the word mama, but today is a good day to be here um, when Poppy has the Noran virus. <laughs> Great timing. <laughs> Don't tell Henry. Don't tweet that. Um, where is Poppy? I want Poppy Lou, she sang. I picked her up and held her, inhaling her silky hair, smelling school on her, paste, paint, and oranges. It made me long for my sister the way she longed for hers. I remembered walking into new schools, meeting new kids together, walking into spaces where we felt out of place, hands entwined. As I walked Mila home, I thought of my sister, now all grown up. Was she, in Af she was in Africa. What was she doing, preparing for bed? Was she staring into the Rwandan sky, looking at other stars that created different patterns from the ones we would soon see muted by the brilliant lights of Manhattan? That night, I held my girls closely and listened to the patterns of their breathing until they were in sync, until they were one. You have each other, I thought to myself. You can walk through this wild and wonderful life together. You will fight, yes, and you will adapt to each other's quirks, but you will do it together. You will make your sister feel like she is enough. And for me, your mama, well, that is enough. More than enough, that is everything. Yay! I know, we got a lot of mascara. A lot of mascara. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You, Thank you, Meredith. Thank, Thank you so much, y'all. Thank you. Thank you all so Thanks much. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thanks for coming. Okay, Thank you, stay. Meredith. Oh, stay 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 stay. Stay. oh, we are stay seated. Yeah. Oh, stay seated. Thank you, um, thank you, Barbara, Jenna, and Meredith for an absolutely inspiring conversation. I'm Ken Hirsch, the president and CEO of the Bush Center. I have, I have the honor of helping to uh, really uh, communicate and bring to this community uh, the legacy and meaning of this wonderful family. And tonight, it was on full display. Thank you very much for sharing it with us. The, in the museum, um, I hope when you visit the museum, right outside the Oval Office, there's a letter that Jenna wrote to her father ab about going to work on the campaign, and it is just as meaningful as what we just heard tonight. It's really one of the most, um, for me, it's one of the most touching things that's in, that's in the museum. There's signed copies of the book uh, in the lobby. Holidays are approaching. Um, we have the exhibit that opens November 16th. It's All Things Bright and Beautiful, Christmas at the White House as it was in 2005. Uh, remember, if you're not a member of the Bush Center, uh, please become a member and you'll get advance notice to great events like tonight. Um, and it's an absolute joy, uh, again, to celebrate this wonderful family with all of you. Thank you and have a wonderful evening. Thank you.